Hey, this is Gary Seegers. And this is Chris Giannini. And this is the Winning Cures Everything podcast. You're listening to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris. And we'd like to welcome in Antonio Castro, the assistant editor and Big Ten, Big 12, and AAC conference coordinator at Phil Steele Publications. You can follow him on Twitter, at Castro's Kingdom. And you can order the magazine, Phil Steele's College Football Preview at philsteele.com or at every Barnes & Noble and Books A Million and almost every CVS, Publix, Target, Walgreens, Walmart, etc. around the country. So, Antonio, I want to jump right into the magazine before we start going over some, you know, college football for this season. This book is my absolute go-to for preparation before the season. And every year it seems like it's got more information than it did the last. When do you and the staff start working on the next season's edition after the current one has come out? Ah, thank, thanks for having me, first and foremost. I uh, appreciate being on with you guys. Um, we uh, actually start this, uh, the process. It's, a, it's an ongoing process, actually. It's a year-long process, but we, we really start diving into next year. Uh, the day after Thanksgiving, um, we start going over. Phil actually starts writing some of the, uh, the team pages and, and analysis, going over the offense, defense, offensive line, defensive line, running back, quarterback situations, uh, c- coming into the season and how they're going to fare going into the next season that actually starts the day after Thanksgiving. So it goes from there and then all the way through all the spring games uh, get completed and, and we finish it up uh, right around that time. And then it gets, it gets sent off to the printers late May, early June, and then it hits the newsstands late June. Good. Great. And it's grown immensely uh, it, since it first started. Now I would imagine, you know, the number of employees it has to be pretty large nowadays. How many people actually work on these magazines and, and how much responsibility does each person actually have? You know, for, you're the coordinator yeah. of three different conferences. Like, are you gathering the information for all 36 of those teams? Yes, yes. Uh, that's that's what we do here. Actually, the staff has actually shrunk a, li- a little bit, believe it or not, as the teams and, and, and FBS teams overall have grown. Kind of kind of going against the grain a little bit, if you will. <laughs> but, um, you know, we were able to, to, to tackle all that, uh, you know, I think finding the right people. Uh, in the situation where they can handle more than than what previous people may be used to, and and just um, you know getting really college football fans and and college football enthusiasts uh, in the office and and working on this thing year round, I think has helped as well. But um, the staff has actually shrunk down to where there's only about four or five of us that are actually working on 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 um, you know all 12 or 13 conferences now. That are taking place when you when you factor in the independence as well, um, and believe it or not, I mean I think when when the first Phil Steele Preview magazine came out, I believe there was just 86 teams, and now it's grown to all the way to 130. And Phil um, actually has us helping him write the teams now, where in years past he used to write every single line on every single team, where now he has us go, going over uh, on certain teams. We actually write the the quarterbacks, the running backs, the receivers, the O line. Uh, all each each individual position unit where Phil chimes in, um, factors in like the, the last sentence or two and, and how he wants to incorporate how the, how the each position is going to uh, be affected in the upcoming season. And then, of course, his, his forecast at, at the end of each um, individual team write-up is all Phil's. He still writes 100, all 130 of those. But, um, yeah, believe it or not, the staff has actually shrunk a little bit in, in recent years. Good, great. Yeah, I, I cannot imagine. Now, I, of course, once the season preview is done, it, you've never, like, you don't really finish because you guys have a newsletter, right, inside the press box? Yes, and correct. I've, I've checked it out a little bit. Uh, you can find that in uh, InsideThePressBox.com. Now, fill us in on exactly what that is and, and what goes into it. Sure, yeah. Inside the press box is... It's almost like it's a it's a midweek newsletter. It's it's released uh, you know, each week during the season, and it has in it every single FBS versus FBS matchup that's taking place for that particular week. So um, and, and it it goes into it almost has it's a, a team by team uh, projection, and it has Phil's computer, all of his forecasted numbers that his computer comes up with, with a, a box a projected box score that has what. The, each team will finish up um, rushing yards, passing yards, uh, the, the projected point total on on the game, everything like that, and, and then this, it also has all, a, that, that's all from like his uh, his computers, right? Yes, that's okay. from his computer. And then he also there is also a write up on each game. 
that has, you know, that takes the human factor into it. And, and if, you know, Phil actually agrees with what his computer is projecting, you know, he'll write that in there. If he doesn't, if he's, if he's leaning the opposite way, then obviously he'll, he'll write that in there as well and, and tell you why. And it, it just kind of goes into a, a game by game preview of each, of every single game for that particular week. And then you got to remember there's sometimes there's, there's up to uh, you know over over 50 games a week, so that's oh, yeah. that keeps us busy as well during the week, um, especially going into uh, uh, you know once the once the magazine season is winding down and and there's not a whole lot uh, to do in terms of of getting the actual magazine work done, then we just take take and tackle into each each game by game uh, individually and and see and project actually who's going to win each game, not only uh, straight up but also. Um, against the Vegas number, too. That's something that I love about this because there's a lot of betting information. And our show and our website, winningcureseverything.com, have, we've always been big on you know, trying to guess the line and, and figure out what Vegas is doing to see exactly who's good and who's not. And at, I'm actually going to get into a little bit of that here in a minute. Uh, we've got Antonio Castro from Field Steel Publications with us. Follow him on Twitter at Castro's Kingdom. Now, you're the conference coordinator for the Big Ten, Big 12, and AAC. I want to jump into the two Power Correct. Five ones very briefly, and then I want to get into the AAC because we're from Memphis, and I want to know what the Tigers are going to look like. So, in the Big sure. Ten, the the early Vegas lines, and, and most everyone across the country, seem to be writing off Michigan as not much of a threat to Ohio State or Penn State this season. My co-host, Chris, however, thinks that Michigan is possibly going to be in the college football playoff because of his belief in Jim Harbaugh. Now, is he crazy for believing that Michigan's talent level is equal to those other schools, even after losing, what is it, seventeen starters? Yeah, yeah, they lost. They lost a whole bunch. They only get. They only have five starters coming back. Four of them on offense. They do get Wilton Spate back at the quarterback position. They only return one on defense, though, and that's going to be key for Michigan. But um, you know, he's not. He's not entirely all that crazy. And here's why: uh, we still have. We don't have Michigan winning the Big Ten, obviously, but we do have them finishing uh, third behind Ohio State and Penn State, as Michigan is the least experienced between those tr- those top three trio there. However, if you take a look, uh, just last year. A team like Ohio State came into the season vastly inexperienced, but then by the end of the season, all those all those young young kids were uh, were more experienced. They ended up reaching the playoffs. Michigan, similar to Ohio State, that game is obviously played on the last week of the season. They're vastly inexperienced coming into the year. Well, by that twelfth game, all those kids that that were vastly inexperienced are going to have uh, eleven games under their belt. A full Big Ten slate under their belt. They'll have played at Penn State. They'll have played at Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, and they get Ohio State at home. So it's, he's not entirely way off base. Now, we don't think that Michigan will beat Ohio State this year, but do they have a chance? Absolutely. Jim Harbaugh is a heck of a coach. And, um, and not only that is, uh, you know, you got to take a look. The, the talent level, the Michigan has, has had pretty significant talent, and they've upgraded that talent even, so, even since Jim Harbaugh has got there. And you, see, you saw what he did with the talent level that he was left behind when Brady Hoke was the coach, which the talent actually was better than people people thought around the country. And he, he get he got that talent to even play even better. And now, you know, he's in the in the third year in his in his system. Uh he's got his own players in there that he's been recruiting now for three years. So Michigan even though they are vastly inexperienced, they don't have very many returning starters coming back, they still have a a lot of talent all over that team. All even with just one one returning starter on defense. He'll get the most out of those kids, and Jim Harbaugh is one of the best coaches in the country. I I agree with you there. I I don't know that you know Ohio State's got so much coming back, so I'm I'm of course going opposite of Chris. I think Ohio State is going to win that uh, that division, but I mean that I initially thought he was crazy, but when you go back and look at the roster, I I do agree with you. He's he's got a chance to do something there, and and getting Ohio State at home at the end of the year is big too. So let's uh, let's move yeah. on to the Big Twelve. Uh, I'm noticing a trend. We went over the Golden Nugget opening lines, and Vegas seems to be really high on Baylor this year. Now, Matt Rule, of course, is he was fantastic at Temple. He builds really tough teams. But on our show, we've always discussed that it's quicker to take a tough team and turn them into a finesse-style team, and it takes longer for finesse teams to turn tough. You know, kind of the same way that Petrino's Arkansas teams didn't immediately take under uh, Brett Bielema. Now, is sure. there something that I'm missing with Baylor this year? Why why is Vegas giving them so much love right now? Well, they, you know, 
as far as the, the the problem with Baylor is is going to be the depth. Now, when you when you're just, as long if they can stay healthy, uh, you know they still are uh, a very viable threat in the uh, in the Big Twelve. We actually have them. Um, ranked as having the number, they still have plenty of offensive power, uh, offensive firepower. We have them ranked as actually the 22nd offense in the country. Um, they've got their 23rd rated running back core in the country, number 37 wide receiver. The offensive line is a little bit shaky at number 42, but, uh, you know, their D line, which their defense is, is going to be the weakness, but their D line is the strength of that, of, of that defense. And, uh, you know, so that that's going to help them as well. The problem, the other problem with Baylor, though, besides the depth and the new coach is that, uh, you know, they're going to be underdogs in probably four games this year. When you're looking at Oklahoma, they'll probably be a dog, even though they're at home. They'll be a dog at Kansas State more than likely. They'll be a dog at Oklahoma State, who's one of the favorites to win the Big 12. And then they'll probably be a dog at the end of the year against TCU. So, um, you know, if they can somehow manage to get through, you know, that that four games uh, stretch there, then obviously the you know they'll be right there in the mix. But um, that's going to be tough to do. And again, their depth is very very shallow after after uh, you know the problems that they had with the Title Nine issues and everything else. And oh, yeah. and uh, you know with form what 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 the former coach um, you know Art Briles left them with there. But uh, when you're talking about Matt Rule, this is a guy. This is like the perfect guy that they could have into their into the situation that they had because they had all those issues. And Matt Rule is known as the total opposite. He's a no nonsense type of guy, but he's also a player's coach at the same time. And and I think Baylor will probably struggle a little bit this year. I mean, I don't see them uh, even maybe maybe like we 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 have them actually at sixth, finishing sixth in the Big Twelve, which um, that's probably right where they'll. Where, where, I mean, it is where that we see them finishing at. Um, give them a couple of years. They'll get rule a couple of years to have his guys in the system, and, and Baylor should be right back there atop the you know the Big 12 up there with Oklahoma and Oklahoma State and, and Texas. Don't forget them. They're going to be competing as well uh, with the, with the new coaching hire and Tom Herman there. But uh, Baylor just depth is going to hurt them this year. It's not a matter of when players get or if players get hurt. It's more mostly a, a matter of when they get hurt, and it's bound to happen. And their depth just cannot they they can't they cannot take any hits as far as their depth goes and and you know we we all see football each and every saturday guys get hurt guys go down it's a physical game and baylor's going to have a problem once the guys start getting injured i agree now of course their non-conference slate is uh is pretty easy so they may not have to worry about it there but <laughs> yeah the cup, cupcake as usual liberty utsa and at duke so yeah um you know They'll they'll be favored in all those games. I mean, Duke is a, is kind of a toss up depending on what um, how Duke responds after last year. They they kind of had a letdown year, but um, I expect Duke to to bounce back. We expect Duke to have a little bit more of a bounce back year. But yeah, Baylor is known for the cupcake uh, non conference schedule, which is good for for a new coach and Matt oh, yeah. Rule and and a and a team short on depth. All right, now you brought up Tom Herman, and I didn't even plan on asking this, but I, I'm just curious your take. I don't think that talent has been the problem at Texas. Um, and I wouldn't have thought that coaching would be the problem under under uh, Charlie Strong, but what do you think Texas is capable of this year? Well, we have Texas is at, Texas actually finishing number three in the, in the uh, in the Big Twelve this year. We actually have them, uh, you know, get into a bowl a bowl game. We have them number four on our most improved team list and number nine on our surprise team list. And our most improved team list is a, is a non bowl team that that is expected to get to a bowl game this year. And actually, the surprise team, the number nine surprise team, that's teams that are, uh, you know, are capable if things all fall their way of of getting, you know, surprise national championship contender. So we have high expectations for Texas. You, just as you mentioned, talent hasn't been the problem. And again, I, I agree, actually agree with you in terms of Charlie Strong. I thought he was a good hire when they when they made it. I mean, he did wonderful things at at Louisville, and he was a very very good assistant under urban meyer at florida and uh but the problem that he had was there's a lot of outside influence when you're talking about texas um coming from the uh, alumni base there and and who actually runs that program and i think that's what what the problem that that charlie strong r- ran into and he just was up not only up against the, each team that he was facing each week but he was up against the powers that be in Austin, unfortunately, and um, he'll bounce back. I mean, he's in a good situation at USF. Texas got their guy that they wanted in Tom Herman, another Ohio State assistant coach, um, which is ironic enough. But, um, you know, we, we actually 
like Texas a lot this year. We have them as a surprise team, and you know they're probably um, only going to be dogs in, in potentially three games. So you know you're looking at nine games that they'll be favored in. Uh, definitely have a chance. Uh, you know USC early in the year they can even lose that game and still perhaps get to a, a national championship game if they run the table and look good in the Big 12. Because don't forget the Big 12 will have a uh, title game this year. Um, where, where, which they haven't, and it has hurt that the, uh, the teams in that conference in years past. Agreed. Now, the, the Big 12 champion from last year, I'm curious, how much panic did you guys have after the magazine had already gone to press and then Bob Stoops comes out and announces he's retiring? Does that change anything for, for your outlook, or you know, is it still kind of the same thing? I mean, it's, it's basically the same coaching staff, right? Yeah, it, it, that's a great question. Um, yeah, and when it happened, we were like, Unbelievable. You know, all these things, all these changes happen. And, of course, you know, you have Bob Stoops, one of the, you know, a, a coaching legend in Norman, and, and he announces his, re- his retirement a week after our magazine uh, went to the press. Um, we don't actually have an issue with Oklahoma this year. We had them picked to win the Big 12, and we remain confident that, that Oklahoma will win the Big 12, and here's why. Um, you know, Lincoln Riley is the new head coach. He's It happened after the spring, so everything – pretty much for Oklahoma has already been set up, um, you know, where they want to be offensively, defensively, everything have you. Um, not much changes are, are going to take place there. And, and here's the real thing with, with Lincoln Riley. You know, um, Phil actually has a great relationship with, with Gil Brandt, who is one of the great NFL minds. And, a few year, and he talks to Gil constantly. And one of the things Gil had brought up to Phil just even uh, – it was a couple of years ago, just out of the blue, he said – Phil, uh, Phil, keep an eye on this on, on this kid and this coach that I'm going to tell you about. His name is Lincoln Riley. I think he's going to be a, a future head coaching star in a couple of years. Well, that was a couple of years ago, and <laughs> what, what what happens? He gets named the uh, Oklahoma head coach for this year. So, uh, you know, he's he he's a, a great mind. People have a lot of respect for him, and Oklahoma should be fine this year just because everything was already set in place, and Bob Stoops left them with you know, just immense talent in Oklahoma was the pick anyway. And, uh, you know, it may, we'll see how it happens in years in, you know, in the future years, but for this year, Oklahoma is set up to win that big 12 and we still uh, feel that they're capable of doing so. That's Lincoln Riley was actually brought up for the Memphis coaching job before Mike Norvell was brought in. So let, let's mm-hmm. jump into the AAC and specifically the Tigers. I am extremely high on Memphis this season. I think Norvell is the same as Lincoln Riley. Like, he's a, a future head coaching star. Um, I think the schedule sets up very well for him. They've got a really experienced team coming back. And we've seen great young coaches achieve big things quickly at schools that had a great foundation from a previous coach. You know, B, uh, P.J. Fleck at Western Michigan, uh, Jeff Brom at Western Kentucky. I, I think Norvell ends up in a Power 5 job next season because I think Memphis wins the AAC this year. Am I nuts for thinking that? No, I mean, you're not nuts. We actually have Memphis uh, finishing in a three-way tie in the West with Houston and Tulsa. And, uh, you know, the only the only um, drawback for them, the only reason why and we don't actually have them making it to the the AAC championship game, we have Houston going. But that's only because, uh, you know, they play at Houston and they play at Tulsa. So that's, you know, the, the top two teams in that West division. Unfortunately, Memphis has to travel to both of those places. They're going to be underdogs in both those games. Now, they can win those games. There's no doubt about that. But they will be underdogs in those games. And that's why we had them finishing the third out of the three-way tie at first between Houston and Tulsa. But they're definitely capable. We actually have them also as the t- as number four uh, ranked non-Power 5 team in the country. So uh, we have a lot of respect for Memphis. And Norvell has done a great job. I mean, you know, he took that team uh, last year. They went 8-5, and five, and, you know, he's got nine starters back on offense. Riley Ferguson is a tremendous quarterback. Um, Dorsey is, a, is a, you know, between him and Taylor coming back at running back position. And then don't forget, I mean, Anthony Miller is a stud at wide receiver. Oh, yeah. So they, they just have a ton of talent on offense. We actually have them as our 19th ranked offense in the entire country. And uh, and uh, led by led by Riley Ferguson. I mean, six four, two hundred and ten pounds. Just had a tremendous year last year. He completes. He's got a high percentage completion rate. He's thirty two touchdowns, ten interceptions. I mean, uh, Memphis fans should be enthusiastic this year, and they definitely, definitely uh, have a chance 
um, to to win the AAC and to win the West. They just have to get through that the the, the couple of road games there against a tough Tulsa team and also a tough Houston team. I think the biggest problem with them last year was Jackson Dillon was injured, and he is you know he's the quarterback of that defense, and he's back this season. So I, I feel like yeah. the defense will be improved. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm high high on that team. Uh, Again, we've got Antonio Castro from Field Steel Publications with us. Uh, that's going to wrap it up. You can follow him on Twitter, at Castro's Kingdom. Man, we really appreciate you being on with us. Hopefully we can get you on again at some point during the season. Uh, before we let you go, I was reading up on your Twitter page a little bit, doing a little research. Noticed you are a big boxing fan. Now, yes. we're huge yes. fight fans. I'm curious, what, what upcoming fight are you most interested in? And it doesn't have to be scheduled yet. Like I'm still waiting on the Deontay Wilder-Anthony Joshua fight to be announced. Like, that would be mine. So who, who are you most interested in seeing coming up, uh, you know, in August, September, et cetera? Oh, well, I mean, the, big, <laughs> this, the <laughs> biggest fight is uh, obviously Triple G and Canelo. That's the one that, oh, yeah. uh, you know, this is, the problem with, it, with boxing in the past is, you know, you get these matchups and you get these, these, these guys that, you know, two guys at the, in their prime um, at the top of the sport, and it usually takes years for it to marinate, and then by the time they end up fighting, they're both, you know, over the hill or, or past their primes. Well, it's the Pacquiao it's not the case this time. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, this time you're getting two of the top pound for pound guys in 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 the world facing each other in their primes. It's basically a toss up fight. I mean, you got uh, you know fifty fifty. It's split as far as who people think are going to win this thing. And um, this is a, a fight that boxing really needed to have two guys, the top guys in the sport, actually fighting each other in their primes. That's the one that I'm looking forward to the most. The, the Mayweather-McGregor fight, I know the public loves that. Uh, it's a novelty. And it's going to get... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a novelty. It's going to get huge numbers. Uh, you know, that's one that I'm going to go to a buddy's house and we'll watch it and split together. But as far as the Triple G Canelo fight, you know, I have no problem throwing down money for that pay-per-view and, and inviting a bunch of people over for that, for that one. That one is going to be – it's just fireworks. It's, going to, oh, yeah. it's definitely going to end in a knockout. I, I agree. Triple G is, is the most exciting fighter to me. Um, you know, I don't know that his style is always uh, exactly perfect, but – he just throws haymakers all the time. <laughs> like it's it's yeah. a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. It's all right. So it, before we let you go, I do want to ask about the uh, the Pacquiao Horn fight. It, what were sure. your thoughts on it? I mean, what obviously it looked to me, uh, just as a bystander, it looked to me like Pacquiao won that fight. And I I've gone back and watched it probably at just three times, just to just to see if maybe I missed something, and. I mean, I thought Horn got away with elbows and headbutts and all sorts of stuff, got no points taken off. How how did they get away with this? I think it's what, what troubles boxing the most is that people can't figure out what the actual rules are, and they can't figure out how you're supposed to determine a winner. Yeah, well, you know, that – the issues that you brought up are, are were huge and were huge factors in how that fight ended up, um, you know, ended up playing out. Uh, I thought the referee did a horrible job as far as letting Horn get away with dirty tactics. I mean, maybe it was because he had fifty thousand Australians screaming behind him and you know in a hostile environment like that. Because he did, he he got away with 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 being the rough and dirty fighter. And when you when a referee allows that to happen, um, you know things. Crazy decisions end up taking place. I thought it was a sloppy fight. I mean, it was hard to really see who was landing cleaner shots because, um, sure, it, the punch that showed that Pacquiao landed, you know, many more shots. But, you know, I, I took, went back and watched it as well. And while I thought Pacquiao won the fight, I thought the referee did him a disservice in, in allowing Horn to, to be overly physical and, and got away with, with uh, uh, numerous fouls that, that weren't even uh you know weren't even with with no point deductions taking place or really without even a lot of stern warnings uh happening as well so uh when you have that it, it, i i did think it was a close fight i mean you could i could argue that Pacquiao won by two i could even argue that Pacquiao won by one round um but when you have you know the judges and and you've got 50,000 people screaming behind them and every single time Horn lands a punch the oohs and ahs are going to sway judges uh, decisions i didn't think it was a travesty i didn't think it was like the worst decision in boxing history like like many people have have insinuated um, i've seen far far worse 
uh, decisions, and that Pacquiao's been the victim of a far worse decision uh, than that against Timothy Bradley in the past. But, oh, yeah. um, you know, it, it was just one of them where the, the referee played a significant role in the outcome of that fight, unfortunately, because, cause, because Pacquiao didn't deserve to go out like that, uh, you know, against a fighter that, let's be honest, I mean, he, he should have been able to put away Jeff Horn at this point of his career, but he did look uh, every bit of his 38 years of, years of age in that Yes, one. he did. Yes, he did. All right, that's going to wrap it up, my friend. We, uh, we're definitely going to try and get you back on at some point during this uh, football season. And I may even bring you back for, you know, fight talk, if we can do that. Absolutely. So, I would love it. A- anytime, anytime. I am, I am available. Wonderful, wonderful. Man, we appreciate it. We will, uh, we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Had a lot of fun. This is Gary Seegers, your co-host and owner of Winning Cures Everything, the best sports blog and podcast in the South. There are a ton of ways that you can connect with us. First, check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. Second, give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. Third, follow us on Twitter, at winningcures, or myself, at ProSevereGary, or at Chris B. Giannini. Four, email the show, winningcureseverything at gmail.com. Fifth, download, subscribe to, and review the podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Tune in, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all of your favorite podcast apps. We'll have new shows up every Tuesday and Friday morning along with different articles throughout the week. Remember, winningcureseverything.com.